We are um, continuing in our sermon series on resolving conflict in your life. And if you turn in your Bibles to Proverbs 28, 13, page 4, 5, 6. Isn't that easy? Page 4, 5, 6 in those Bibles there at your seats. Some people said, why are you sitting so much, Pastor, when you're preaching? Well, honestly, I hate sitting and preaching because I'm pretty animated, but I hurt my back a few, and I actually herniated a disc, and then I fell, I got it repaired, and fell over my dog, and I did it again. I herniated the one above it, so isn't that great? So anyway, I, I just, I only have so many minutes a day of standing, and here I am, so... Be patient with me, and we'll get back to standing and getting energetic again. But hey, we started this series three weeks ago, and we started with the right priority, and we talked about the gunny sack. Remember the big gunny sack? And if you missed that, you can check it on your card or say, hey, send me the first week of this, and we'll get that CD out to you. Or you can go online and listen to that uh, or watch it online. And we had a big gunny sack, and we had all this stuff we filled it up with. We had a husband and a wife up, and, and they were arguing, you remember. And, and each one of those blocks represented something. And, and what they would do is hold on to the stuff in their life. They would hold on to that conflict. And then instead of resolving it, they would get all mad and dump it out on the table and sort through it and get really angry with each other and put it back. So the whole point of that was we can't let conflict build up. If we want to live at peace with each other, if we want to live at peace with God, we can't have a bunch of conflict going on. We need to resolve it. And you have two choices. You can either reconcile or overlook. You you can overlook. Um, Love covers a multitude of sins. We looked at that scripture, and there's lots of other scriptures about that. But if you overlook it, you can't bring it up in six months or six years or 16 years and say, hey, what about that time? Remember when? And you fill in the blank with this list of stuff. And so We don't want to get hysterical and we don't want to get historical. We want to resolve conflict. And that's the point of this series to help us not help you help someone else. This is all about working through it in us and making us better peacemakers. And so you got to have the right priority and resolve conflict quickly. And then we said the right focus. And remember that week I gave you all a little tiny mirror in, in a little velvet pouch, and, and I said, keep this with you, and when you are in conflict, just take this mirror out and look at yourself, because it's, success in conflict is not about who wins and who loses, it's all about who you're reflecting in that heated moment, and the question is, are you reflecting God? God wants us to live for His glory, and so are we, are we reflecting God, remember that mirror, reflecting God in the heat of the moment, in that conflict. And then we talked about having the right heart, the right heart. And I gave you a magnifying glass, and that kind of backfired on me, didn't it? Because as soon as Ellen walked in, she said, does this mean we have to get examined by somebody? No, no, no. This wasn't so you could use on your spouse. I didn't think of that. Uh, This is so you could use on your own heart. You're not supposed to use on anybody else. And we talked about that. And we're actually going to bring that verse up again and talk through that today. Today we want to talk about the right approach. This is our next one. And we're going to be seeing that the, there is a best approach, a right approach to have in conflict. But first we want to discuss what happens when we have the wrong approach. What happens when we approach things the wrong way? And this takes place in us. This is a problem in us. When Have you ever noticed when a dog approach, does something wrong, you know, you're out, you come home, they've gone to the bathroom somewhere they shouldn't have gone. What happens to that dog? I don't know about yours, but ours is mopey and he's kind of off in the corner and his head's low. He won't look up at us. He wants to look up at us, but he just can't. Is that same thing with some of you guys? Or, you know, you, you yell at him for something, you know, and, and he's mopey, you know, and he just can't look up at you kind of his tails between his leg. We call that in society, we call that being downcast, being downcast in spirit. And the same thing is kind of true with kids. When a young child does something wrong, I don't know about your kids, but my kids, especially one of my children more than maybe the others, but just about all of them, especially when they were younger, you could walk into a room and you could go, what did you do? Because <laughs> you just knew, right? Right. They're, you know, you could just look at them and they're, 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 they had it all over them that 
they had just done something or they, you know, they, sh they shouldn't have done or they lied about something or whatever. And what happens? They, they hide. Is that not true? They, they might hide or try to, you know, cover their face if they're really young, right? Or they, their head is downcast, just like a, a little downcast puppy. Or perhaps um, their personality changes, their, 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 their enthusiasm and their, their joy. They have a loss of joy. Their joy just leaves them. And this happens with adults too, doesn't it? If, if you or someone you love, an adult, uh, does something dumb, right? Um, an adult does something they shouldn't do, what happens to them? There's some shame that comes into their heart, isn't there? There's some shame that happens and it starts to affect them. It starts to affect them. Shame, sorrow, guilt. You can have immense regret in certain situations when the bigger the sin, the more of these there might be, the more uh, 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 things that might be going on. Extreme sadness can take place. And I'm not just talking about mistakes. That's one level of category that we could talk about. But I'm talking about things that we do on purpose. Uh, something that not, not like a, you can take an eraser out and correct a math problem type of mistake. But a sin. Something that we did that we know is wrong. That we shouldn't have done. That may be impacted and aff affected or, or maybe infected someone we care about or love in, in, in a great way. And then with you have all of these things going on here, you can have depression, can't you? Maybe you haven't linked that with this, but, but that's a true case many times. I'm not saying all depression is caused. You can have something organic happening in you, and you can have depression because of, you know, all kinds of stuff going on in you. But if you have all of this stuff going on and it's something pretty serious, can I just say most of the time, if not all the time, I don't like to use those kind of absolutes, but most of the time you'll have some depression as a result of having stuff in you that you need to process, that you need to, to deal with. It can be really severe depression as well. And then what happens to your relationship with other people? Have you ever had a best friend owe you money and not repay and, and, and then see you in the grocery store across the store and then duck around the aisle and kind of, you've never had that happen to you, right? Come on. And then, or, or you know, here, here's one that has happened. You know, we've had, we've had everything told to us in ministry. It's amazing. But maybe somebody, a best friend does something right? Or maybe a best friend goes out with a girlfriend or something, and then all of a sudden they avoid you. On the other side of the street they walk, or, or, or what, and then your friends get split up, right? People sort of take sides, and we kind of alienate ourselves from other people. We deal with sleeplessness, but people avoid and sneak as a result of, 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 of sin, of, of unconfessed stuff in their life. They can avoid, hide, sneak around. How about this one? If you're married for any length of time at all, you might notice once in a while they do something dumb and they get irritable. Because <laughs> it just sort of comes out of us, that irritability. It's bothering us, this thing inside of us. We can have outbursts as another. We start lashing out. We want to make ourselves look better. We want to maybe minimize what we did wrong. Everybody does what we did right, or, or, or everybody's worse than we did. They did something worse, but the truth is something in us is bothering us. And all of you are thinking about that other person now, aren't you? I know what you're thinking. You're thinking about that other person that this applies to. But I want you to focus in on your life when you've had unconfessed stuff in your life. Outbursts happen. And then how about blame shifting? Blame shifting. We want to minimize what we've done wrong and kind of shift the blame to other people. And that's a sort of form of outburst going on. Belittling other people. Now you're probably really thinking about that person, right? We have had to expand the columns here with this one. But um, what happens when, what, what happens with our relationship with God? Did you know the same sort of things happen with God? We got to go to three columns, but 
we can start avoiding church. Did something really dumb? And we start, you know, we go to church and you hear a message and, and something pricks you in your heart. You know, that's the Holy Spirit. But you think, if I just stay away from church, right? If I just don't go, then maybe I won't hear it. I'll feel better about myself. So, you know, there's some of that going on. And then part of that, you avoid God. You avoid God. Maybe you stop praying. You stop reading your Bible. And because when you do, again, there's something in you that gets stirred and that starts bringing up. You start kind of reliving some of those moments. So it's just easier to just stay away. You know you should go, right? You should read your Bible. You should pray. You should, you know, spend some time with God. You should go to church. God designed us and made us for that. So the problem with this here is when you don't do that, when you avoid God, you end up feeling worse. It's like this cycle. Now you have something else heaped on to all of this stuff in our life, and we don't feel better. We actually feel worse. When we go to church, we feel better about ourselves, but then that, that guilt comes back, that shame, that, that feeling of, well, we got to do something with this. We did something dumb. We got to, and it bothers us again. Adam and Eve did the same thing, didn't they? We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. They sinned against God, not just three chapters in the Bible. The earth has got, still got the new earth smell, and here they are sitting, and, and, and they, they go out, they, they, they eat the fruit that God told them not to eat, and then they hide from God. God shows up in the cool of the day, and Adam, where are you? God, did God know where Adam was? Of course he did. And then, and then they start blaming each other, and we talked about that last week. They start blaming each other, and that's exactly what we do. And all of this, if you are dealing with all of this on your list, if you have this stuff going on in your life, what do you think happens to your stress level? Our stress level naturally goes up. There's increased stress. And do you know increased stress causes a whole bunch of health problems? A whole bunch of health problems from, from a heart disease to high blood pressure to um, uh, more depression can come on. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm depressed and, and all of this anxiety and then health problems and then more depression as a result of that. Anxiety can take place. Here's my favorite one. I'm just kidding, being facetious. Gastrointestinal problems. Aren't you glad you came to church to learn that? Aren't those fun? And, um, and then ladies, this is a big one for you, men, for us too. But, but you know, ladies have, a, I think, a harder time. That may not be true, dealing with age. But increased stress and all of the weight of this stuff actually accelerates aging. Isn't that crazy? You got to get that conscience cleansed so you can not age as fast, ladies, right? And then if we age faster and we have increased risk of heart disease and all these other things, we have a higher risk of premature death. Isn't that crazy? Premature death. And then there's one more that happens in a lot of people's lives, not everybody, but in a lot of people's lives, they actually have such regret in their life, such heavy burdens, such heavy pain from the wake of sin maybe that they've caused that they just need some relief. They just need a few minutes a day, a few hours a day, a little bit of time a week, whatever, with some numbness so that they can just stop feeling. And so they turn to addictive behaviors. And I'm not just talking about alcohol. I'm talking about uh, uh, addictions to, to drugs. It doesn't have to be illicit drugs. Uh, it can be not heroin. We automatically go there in our mind, but but it could be prescription medication, right? You, you take a pain pill when there really isn't any pain. The only pain you're dealing with is something in your soul. And, and you're so burdened, so heavy, so, so troubled, so tormented in your heart that, that you, you take a pill because you, you got to get some sleep. You've been laying awake at night having all of these imaginary conversations all of these, what if I wouldn't have ever slept with her and had this monumental chaos? What, what if I wouldn't have talked her into that abortion? What if I hadn't had that abortion? All, I mean, as, as they get bigger, then these things get bigger as well. And, and it causes more and more and more pain, more and more and more sleeplessness, more and more 
depression, more and more anxiety. These things just continue to escalate. And it's painful. And I'll, I'll, I'll bet you that I'm not the only one today that's here in this room that's dealt with, personally dealt with some of these things happening in my life. Maybe not all of them. Maybe you haven't dealt with all of them. Maybe you know people who are dealing with all of these, but I'm probably not the only one, and you're probably not the only one. Probably all of us on some level have dealt with or are dealing with some of these undesirable effects. Can we just maybe call it that? That's a business term I learned a long time ago about going through all of the negative stuff to find the root cause. And we can go to a doctor and we can get medicine to help us numb some of this. We can get medicine to, to try to coat over some of these symptoms so at least we can get some relief for a moment. But the problem is those drugs, those medications, they just kind of cover things up. They don't get to the root cause. They don't fix the pain. It just kind of numbs it. And as soon as that medication wears off, the next day, the, you know, in four hours, whenever you have to take it again, the, the pain starts to come back and you start to have the regrets and you start to have all the stuff, right? The good news today that you came to church for, not to hear all of that, it got really quiet in here and I'm really sorry to, but we have to talk about the problem to give us the solution. The good news is God in his infinite wisdom knew that this would happen before the foundations of the earth were laid. When we mess up, when we did something wrong, it wasn't a shock when he arrived in the garden and Adam was hiding himself. He, he knew all the consequences sin would have and so much more. He, he knew all of that and he provided a solution. He gave us a verse. And here's the incredible thing today. We only have really one verse. We're going to have a couple other verses, but if you get this one verse, it's about to flash on the screen, this one little tiny sentence, it's a compound sentence. There, you know, if you remember that in, in grammar school, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a sentence, a good sentence, but if you'll just get this and apply this to your life, it will, one, explain a lot, but it will also provide you a solution. It's not an easy solution, and we're not very good at the solution, but it is an amazing solution to the problem. Are you ready for the verse? Ready? Here's the bad news first, and we've already kind of covered that. Excuse me. That hasn't happened in a long time. There we go. He who conceals his sin does not prosper. Isn't that the truest thing you've read all week? I mean, come on, right? Did, did I even have to share that with you? I mean, that is so, we don't think about it. That's the problem. But when you see that statement overlaid in the background of all of those things that happen in people's lives who keep try to keep all of that secret, he who conceals his sin does not prosper. That is so, so true. I mean, if you think about all of those symptoms, all of those things that result as, a, as keeping a secret sin secret, or, 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 or something happened to you, maybe it wasn't your fault and somehow you're blaming yourself. There's some of that that happens because sin creates a wake. Sometimes it's stuff that happened to us that like, Kim was molested when she was five years old. She, she had to process that. She couldn't keep it in. As she kept it in, it created a lot of these symptoms. So she had to get help and, and get that out of her. He who conceals his sin does not prosper. It wasn't even hers to, 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 to de conceal, but she was keeping that in. And it wasn't her fault at all, but it has a way of eating at us. It has a way of of knowing at our conscience, at our heart, especially if we're the person that did the dumb thing. But the next part has a but in it. We're going to talk about that incredible magic word, but in just a moment. But whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. That was worth coming to church for. We're going to expound that a little bit more today. Whoever conceals his sin does not prosper. But whoever confesses 
and renounces them. That's the same as repentance. If we confess something and we renounce it and we, we change it, we work to change that in our life, it's the same as repentance. So we confess them, we renounce them amazingly. In God's infinite wisdom, he says, guess what you're going to find at the end of that? Something that's not intuitive. Something you're not going to think is happening. You're keeping it a secret because you think you're better off. But when you, when you, when you confess that, you actually find mercy. You actually can get some help and get relief from the whole list of stuff that's in the background of this slide. Confession is the practical step of the lesson that we talked about last week, of the instructions in the Sermon on the Mount that we read from Jesus, Matthew 7, 3 through 5. This is the practical step. Confession is the solution to the, to, to the thing that we talked about last week. Let's review that scripture quickly. He says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Let me help you with the plank in your own eye, with the speck in your, own eye, in, in your brother's eye, when all of the time there's a plank in your own eye? Then he says these terrible words. I'm sorry I have to put them on the screen. These are the words of Jesus, but they're so offensive to us. You hypocrite, right? We just hate those words. That's what we're being when we're judging someone else and we're not, we're not looking critically at ourselves. He says, you hypocrite, first, first, notice, first, take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to help your brother remove the speck from his eye. Remember that verse? To do this, the practical step of this passage of Scripture is confession, is confession. But part of the problem, as I've alluded to just a moment ago, part of the problem is we're not very good at confession. (laughs) Part of the problem is we stink at confession. We're just so bad at confessing our sins, our our. I'll, I'll let you a little, our mistakes, right? They're really not mistakes. Mistakes don't give us all these symptoms. That's kind of the big difference between mistakes and sins. We like to dumb our sins down to mistakes. That helps us feel a little better. But mistakes never cause sleeplessness and depression and anxiety and fear and all of that stuff. But, but sins, they do cause all of those things. And, and we're so bad at it, and, and most of the time, When people find themselves in a prolonged conflict, a conflict that's gone on for many years, a conflict that's had uh, separated you from someone, say, I haven't talked to them in 15 years. Most of the time, I won't say always, most of the time when people find themselves in a prolonged conflict, it's because they have not made a good and sincere confession of what they've done wrong in that relationship. A lot of the times, that's the case. The typical confession uh, goes something like this. If, (laughs) I want you to just love that word, if. If I've done anything wrong, I'm sorry. (laughs) That's how the typical confession goes. If I've done anything wrong, I'm sorry. Now, I just want to share with you what that means. We're going to explode that and and tell you what you're really saying and what the other person is really hearing. Here's what you're really saying. Ready? Well, I'm not sure if I've done anything wrong, but I can see that you're going to make my life absolutely miserable until you get some satisfaction. So, as a result, here's my token apology. Here's, Here's my token apology to get you off my back. Now, since I have no idea what I've done wrong, and since I have no idea what I'm going to, what I, what I need to change, I'm probably going to do the same exact thing tomorrow. Will you please forgive me? (laughs) That's pretty funny, isn't it? But that's what that means. If I've done anything wrong, sorry, right? Sometimes you even leave the I'm out because you don't want to put the I in there. Sorry, right? I'm sorry. It's like one, one word, almost one syllable. I'm sorry. Sorry, right? And we get that out. But it, it's absolutely worthless, is it not, when we hear that kind of confession? But typically, that's what we hear as confessions, and that's what we give as confessions to people 
that we've hurt, people that we've impacted with our mistakes. Here's the kind of the bottom line today. Genuine confession serves as a first step toward genuine repentance and reconciliation. A genuine confession is the first step toward fixing your relationships. Now, I want to um, go through how to confess sin today. That's the right approach. Now, I'm not, I don't have a verse for each one of these seven steps. There's seven A's of confession. I don't have a verse which is going to bother some of you. Well, if it ain't in the Bible, I ain't going to do it, right? You know that, and I get that. I, I get that. Some of this stuff is just something your grandma probably told your grandpa or you probably heard her say, and she, just some Southern wisdom here that may bother you and the, you know, us in the North. I, I get that. I'm a, I'm a Northerner now, and I can't, sometimes I forget that, so I'm sorry. I, I just... Spent the, you know, lunch a couple hours with Mike and Charlotte from Texas. So some of that Southern soaked back in. I'm sorry. Really sorry. So <laughs> thanks. Thanks, man. So <laughs> bless my heart. Yeah. Do you know what bless your heart means in the South? Yeah, you are so stupid. <laughs> don't, don't use that in the South. Yeah, it's precious. You're precious. That's about the same thing. Anyway. Let's get back to reality here. So these aren't going to have like a verse with each other. However, we have a verse with some of them. And as you think about them, you're going to go, I bet that is how God wants me to confess sin. Here's the first one. Address everybody involved. Address everybody involved. This is, this is a huge one. This is a huge one. You see, too often we're tempted. Here's the biggest problem with it. There's really two problems. We're tempted to only address God with our sin. <laughs> and that's just like, oh my goodness, that we're in big trouble with that, right? And here's the problem. Scripture has far more to say, although we don't like to read those parts, far more to say about talking to other people about our sin, specifically the people we've wronged. For instance, if you've stolen something, you've got to go make restitution, right? If you lied to somebody, you've got to get that corrected. It has far more to say about confessing your sin to the person or people you've wronged than it has to say about confessing your sin to God. And can I just clue you in here? And this might, maybe you haven't really thought about this because some of you are big confessors to God. You like reconfess the same sin every night. I, I get that. I, I, I've been in that loop, right? I'm just going to cue you in with something. God already knows. <laughs> Before you ever said anything, God already knows all about it, the motives behind it, what you were thinking, how it went, the effects it had that you can't even see for generations to come. He knows all about the sin that you're bringing to his attention. So why do we confess to God? I don't know why we get stuck in that loop. In fact, nowhere in the New Testament, anywhere in the New Testament, are we commanded to confess our sin to God or God's representative. Nowhere in the New Testament does that exist. And I know what some of you Bible people are thinking, what about that verse in 1 John? Well, here it is. If we confess our sin... He is faithful and just to forgive us and to purify us from all unrighteousness. The problem is, that verse doesn't tell us who to confess to, does it? The Bible wants us to confess our sins. God wants us to confess our sins to people we've injured, the people we've hurt, the people we've sinned against. He wants us to go to them. And I know this is crazy hard. I get that. We're going to talk through that today. But that's where God wants us to go with this. We've hurt some people along the line with our cold shoulder, with our attitudes, with our actions, and he wants us to go and reconcile that. We should confess our sin to God, but that's just showing ourself primarily that we're now agreeing with God because he is the truth. When we agree with God, that's like the first step. Usually we deny we didn't do it that bad. We didn't do it affect that many people. And that's the warning I have for you. Big giant warning. Pay attention to this warning. Warning. You and I, you and I, we have a natural tendency to minimize the people we've in, in, in affected 
and, and minimize what we've done wrong and minimize the people that we've done the wrong to. We normally say, yeah, they weren't that hurt by that or what I did didn't impact them that much. And we minimize that to keep us from feeling so bad about the situation. So address everyone involved. And the next one is avoid if, but, and maybe. <laughs> this is a huge one, as we kind of already alluded to. People try to excuse their wrongs. So the, the solution is take responsibility. The only way you're going to find some relief for these things that are tormenting you is to confess your sin. Listen, here's, here's some popular confessions. If I've done something wrong, dot, 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 fill in the blank. Perhaps I should have done this. Maybe I should have done that. You ever use that one? You ever heard that one, right? Maybe I should have, but you made me. <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. That word, but, I told you we would talk about it again. That word, but, is a magic word. And, and here's what it means. I know I should not have raised my voice, but you made me so mad. What did I just say there? It's all your fault, right? I know what I did, but it's all your fault that I did it. So here's what you do with a magic word, but. Ready for the solution? You delete the word, but. You insert a period, and you delete the rest of the sentence. That's the solution. I know I should not have raised my voice at you, period. That's it. That's it. Don't excuse your sin. If you have young children, young grandchildren, you need to teach them this stuff. These are so important. They come to confess something to you, teach them as early as possible how to confess their sins. It'll pay huge dividends going forward in their life. Tony Evans, I like to hear fiery Tony Evans preach. He's a good preacher. You can hear him on TV. He said this, if it contains an excuse, it is not a confession. <laughs> That's a pretty good rule of thumb, isn't it? If it contains an excuse, it is not a confession. Admit specifically. That's the next one. Admit specifically both attitudes and actions. We need to admit both of these things. This is not the general, bland, broad confession that you normally hear. This is getting to the heart issues and the motivations behind what you were thinking. This is admitting exactly, precisely what you've done wrong and, and, and how that has impacted the other person. I, I was, I don't know if this was a privilege, but I, I had an opportunity once to it's kind of a last minute ditch effort to go to the, the final divorce signing. And the husband looked at his wife and said, um, I know I have been a, a, not a very good husband and I'll try harder. You could have seen the shade. Th there was just nothing there coming back at him. I mean, absolutely nothing. Because when you looked at her empty face, you saw that the confession had absolutely no effect whatsoever. Basically, what he was saying is, um, as a husband, I have no clue at all what it is I've done. So I have absolutely no idea what to change. The only impact that confession might have had is cementing in her mind somehow that she made the right choice to get rid of this bum because he had no idea how he had contributed to this marriage and the, and the dissolution of it. By getting specific, it really helps people understand how you contributed. That it, it helps them see that you went back in Matthew 7, 3 through 5. And you can all, uh, tell them that also over the last couple of weeks, I've been searching my heart and praying through this verse that I might know how I impacted you. And here's what I found. I did this and I did that. And I wasn't considerate when I said such and such. And I am, you know, and all of these things and, and get as specific as you possibly can about you impacted the situation. You want to mend your relationships? 
then, then specifically admit. The next day is to acknowledge the hurt. Now, I, I, before I get into this one, I want to just say, you can see there's quite a list here. There's seven of these. And maybe if something is, is, is not a big deal, you know, you, you, you were late picking up somebody, you know, or something, you don't, you don't have to legalistically go through this seven A's. That would, that would be a little bit, you know, I know I was late, for, you know, to pick you up, you know, three minutes, but I just really want to acknowledge the hurt, you know, it could get kind of weird. But as those things escalate, as they get more serious, you, you may need to use more of them. And you may need to let this list be a little thing to search your heart and make you more self-aware of how you can have contributed to the conflict. But please don't use this as a mechanical checklist. It'll get old really, really quickly. So we need to acknowledge the hurt. We need to sincerely express the sorrow for what we've done in this situation. You can say things like, I'm so sorry I hurt you as I did. That must have been incredibly painful because I could, I could kind of see it in your face, the, 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 the kind of the sadness that you've been going through. And I caused that. And I just want to acknowledge that. I, I regret that I embarrassed you as I did. I, I, I'm sure that when I was late for the 17th time, and, and, and it's my fault. I, I was frustrated you. You had dinner on the table, and you know, we've been through this over and over, and you've told me, and, and, and I can see that that's been a really frustrating thing for you, and I just want to let you know I see that, and I, I recognize that. Shaping words like that shows the other person that you're not only aware of what you did, but how you impacted them in their life. And it, lets, it gives them some understanding and it'll soften them up to hear what you're saying. The next one is to accept the consequences. When, you, when we have accept the consequences, I was thinking about this uh, this week, trying to think about how best to, to explain it. And I think the story of the prodigal son probably illustrates this in the Bible better than any other thing I could say. You have this boy who's completely disrespected his father to the point that he wished he was dead. He, he spent, blew through, completely wasted all of his money, which was his father's money, which was his family's money. I mean, just completely showed no utter contempt is what he showed for all of that. And then he, God grants him repentance. Did you know repentance is a gift from God? If you're not sorry for what you've done and that's bothering you to some extent, pray that God will give you repentance in your heart. It's a gift. God grants this kid repentance. He grants this, this, this boy repentance, this man, and he's heading home. And as he's heading home, he's planning what he's going to say to his father. He's, he's rehearsing the speech, just like you've done, just like I've done. Usually it's when I can't sleep at nights when this thing goes through my mind, but but you've rehearsed stuff in your mind. And he said this in Luke 15, 19. He said, Dad, I do not even deserve to be your son anymore. That's accepting the consequences, isn't it? Gets, gets even better for him. Make me, Dad, like one of your hired men, like one of your hired hands. What you don't know, unless you research the culture of that, is that's the equivalent of our day laborers. The guys at the 7-Eleven waiting out front to hitch a ride with one of the contractors. The guys at Home Depot waiting out there, hey, do you need a hand today? I can dig a ditch or whatever. One of those guys you pay at the end of the day because you're probably never going to see him again. And yet his dad, they had more than enough to eat. And, and he was saying, dad, I just need help. And I'm not worthy to be your son these were the lowest people in your household. Just, 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 God, just make me like one of them. That's accepting the consequences. That's accepting the consequences. Alter your behavior. As we said a few weeks ago, we can't change ourselves. This again is a gift from God and you need to pray, God, help me do this. And this is the repentance aspect, and you can't really have any relief if you continue to repeat the same thing over and over. In fact, you will destroy whatever relationships you have left if you keep repeating it. So if it's really serious, you need to have something in there about altering your behavior. And I recommend this little statement, with God is my help. Can you just say that with me? With God is my help. 
because I know I'm probably going to mess up again, and I just want to confess it to you. I'm working on it. I'm getting counseling. I'm doing this. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm trying to, to work on this, and here's the steps I'm taking. With God as my help, I'm going to get counseling. I'm going to get an accountability partner. I'm going to throw my cell phone in the river. Did you know people actually could live without that? At one point in life, I, I know that's hard to believe. You know, if you have a, an issue with stuff on the internet, maybe you need to get rid of it. Maybe you need to throw the thing away and your computer away and, and not have a computer at home. That's okay. Or put your computer in a real public place. There's a lot of things you can do to modify your behavior, to get victory over stuff that's causing relationship problems and causing sin in your life and, and so on. So ask... For, and, and, Alter your behavior and express how, what steps you're going to take to fix that. And the last one today, and this one is probably the hardest A that we're going to, that, that, of, of the whole seven. This is the seventh one. It's last on purpose because this is where it goes, but it's the most difficult one because when you use this, you're putting yourself, you're being completely vulnerable. You are completely at the other person's mercy. Are you ready? Hardest day, ask for forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness. You're putting yourself out there. This is nobody's fault but mine. And I just need to, they used to say, beg your forgiveness. You, you remember that? I mean, you probably uh, beg your pardon. That's the same thing, right? I beg your forgiveness. You're, you're, you're putting yourself out there as a beggar to this person. And you're completely vulnerable to them. They can forgive you or not forgive you. But here's the incredible news today. As we went through this verse a few minutes ago, if we do what God says in his word, if we do what God says in his word, guess what? Whether they forgive you or not, if you confess your sins, he, God, is faithful and just and will forgive you of your sin that you confess. And get this, he will purify you from all unrighteousness. Isn't that an amazing promise of God when you put that in complete context with Scripture and everything God tells us to do? Ask for forgiveness and leave it with God. Maybe they're not to a place where they can grant forgiveness. Maybe they need to have some maturity in their Christian walk. Maybe they need to get some counseling on how to forgive. But you put yourself out there and that gives you something to pray for if they don't forgive you. Because if they don't forgive you, they're not forgiven. That may not be the time to point that out because of what you've done. But that's the time when you know what to pray for in their heart now. So, based on all of that, when you confess your sins, this verse is true, isn't it? He who conceals his sin does not prosper putting it back over the background of all the undesirable effects that happen in our life. It's true. If we keep our sin in us, we're not going to prosper. It's going to ruin us, our, our life on a, on, on a, on, on, and our self with all of the high blood pressure and all of that and the stuff eating at, at us. It's going to ruin our close relationships. Maybe your marriage will be at stake. Maybe your past marriages, you're finally going... That's what happened. And, and, and God is starting to speak to you about what happened. And, and, and that's true with your, 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 your children relationships, right? Or your close relationships, your work relationships. Maybe you've lost jobs because you couldn't own up to what, how you contributed to a conflict with your boss. You couldn't confess. You wouldn't confess. You wouldn't come clean with that. Some of you are probably saying, you know what, Pastor, if I said that, I would be fired tomorrow. Pastor, if I said that, I, I would go to jail. I've, ha I've heard that several times in my life. I would go to jail. Friends, I thought the same exact thing for a number of years, for probably more than 10 years of my life. I, I held this thing in, and it was creating a lot of these issues. I couldn't sleep. I was teaching Sunday school. I was even doing preaching because I, I knew I was called into the ministry. So God will keep working in your life. 
But I would preach on stuff like this and I would go, oh my God, I'm so sorry. How am I going to, if I go to them, I, 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 you know, Dan Betzer, he's syndicated radio. You hear him on the radio if you get Christian radio, right? And he's my mom and dad's pastor now. <laughs> it's so funny. And some of you have heard this, but I was, I guess it wasn't 10 years. Maybe it was close to that. I, I, he, through my, he, we went to this Christian school, Fort Myers Christian School. He was the pastor, you know, the head senior pastor. Uh, it's a long story. But anyway, he kicked my friend out of school. We had to get even. We went and blew up his car. I literally blew it up. I mean, you're like, this is my pastor. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Maybe we should, yeah. So that's who your pastor is. And I kept that secret for so, so, so long. And it ate and ate and ate at me. And I was going to preach basically this message. I completely reworked it for this seri series. I just based on something new I'm doing. But I, I was going to preach this. And I said, Kim, I, I can't. I can't do this another day. And I said, here's bail bond money. Here's the account it's in. <laughs> I really did this because this guy's a hard nose. Dan Betzer, he's got a, a, a you know, he's, he's got a big church. He's known to be cut and dry, black and white, ruthless. I said, Kim, here's the bail bondsman you should call. <laughs> I thought he was going to put me in jail. And I went and I went there. I showed up. You know, and, and he's not in town. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. He's not here. I can't see him. He's in Africa or something. And um, so I make an appointment. I say, listen, and the secretary says, can another pastor help you? They're trying to pawn me off. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. I have to see Dan Betzer, please. I, I'll do anything I need. Ten minutes with him. Five minutes. Five minutes with Dan Betzer. And please, please, please. Finally, she relents. And when I walked into his office, he's got this huge... A lion <laughs> that he killed in the because he's a hunter <laughs> on this huge conference table. I mean, the most intimidating office you could ever walk into. It was just terrible. And then I, I sat. He's behind this giant desk, you know, and 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 he's and I sit down. He's 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 kind, but you can tell he's like, what is this about? Come on, hurry up. And um, and I. I got like two words out. And I just start weeping. I just was was absolutely a wreck, and I and I don't. I didn't make it through any. I don't know how many steps I came. But he said, "I thought I would go to my grave and not know who did that," and he forgave me. And I said, "I'll. I have money now. I can pay for the car, whatever." He said, "You're a pastor now in Benita. I was a pastor in Benita. I started a church." He said, I want you to take the money you think you should pay and put it in your own ministry as a gift. Wow. He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them, they find mercy. Do you know why? Because people just don't do this. You're going to shock people. You're going to blow them out of the water. This isn't a guarantee that you won't have a pretty big penalty to deal with. But you'll get rid of all of the stuff in the background of that screen. You'll be able to live with yourself again. He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them, they find mercy. God, we love you today and we praise you. And Father, in the name of Jesus, we went a little extra time today, but God, I know there are people today Lord, the temptation is to think, boy, this sure applies to so-and-so. But God, I hope that we will examine our own hearts. I pray today, Lord, in Jesus' name, that we would take this to truth that you've given us today. And Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit that you would give us a heart that would yearn to obey you and God do as you say and trust you. Even if there's consequences, serious consequences, Lord, prosperity will come back to our life. And I don't mean it in the sense that many people preach on prosperity in this world that's so of, the, of Satan and evil, Lord. I, I mean, Lord, we're gonna be able to live with ourselves again. We're going to be able to have a night's sleep. I, I never slept more peaceful than the night after I confessed to Dan Betson. 
Lord, I pray for him right now. I couldn't pray for him before, but he just had a massive uh, angioplast, and then, Lord, he had to have triple bypass. My parents emailed me and said, praise. Rosemary asked you to come to prayer. It's one of the prayer requests we've been praying for. Dan Betzer. Lord, we pray. Help him recover, Lord. He's an old, old man now, Lord, and he's, he, 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 Lord, I pray that you would help him. Help him, Lord. God, help us get this in our hearts. And Lord, we can let go of the past and give you our sins and our trust. And Lord, confess our sins. Renounce our sins. And Lord, let times of refreshing, as Ellen said, flood our soul in the name of Jesus. God, there is no God like you. What I couldn't speak of before, I don't even know if I ever told my wife before that day, Lord, I can talk about freely now because I don't have to hide anymore. That's how it is with everything we confess, Lord. Help us come out of the shadows, Lord, and help us get the help we need. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Listen, friends, we, we're way over time today. Why don't we do communion next week? It's a shorter message next week. But we're going to bump into the other service here if we're not careful. So forgive me for that. But I think today's message was probably a big help to a lot of people. So if you'll take your communication card out. Um, Cindy, you'll need to take me to the slide there after this song. Take your communication card out after, as you'll see on the back, you'll see some next steps here. Memorize that verse. He who conceals his sin does not prosper. Whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Rememorize that. I've taught it to all of my children. All of my children can probably say that verse to you, or they better be able to. I'm just kidding. And, and but memorize it. It'll help you. Meditate on how you contributed to the conflict, and then confess your sins using as many of the A's as you need to, and it'll help you get real before the Lord. And then, uh, you know, I had an offering moment. I'll use that next week also. If our ushers um, could make their way up, God, we lift up this offering to you in the name of Jesus and ask you to bless the gift and the giver, Lord, that we may win more people to Jesus. That, Lord, they can find out and figure out and learn how to confess their sin. That, Lord, they can get relief in their life. Would you just do that in a multitude of people's lives? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And as you give today, if you're a guest, we just want to uh, remind you to get this book, Case for Christ, as you leave today in the welcome packet. And we just want to, uh, you're a gift to us from the Lord. So please, we want to give you a gift back. And today was a little bit longer than we normally go. But thank you for coming and making South Bay your church today. And also we have refreshments after this service. Uh, out the front door and to your left down the handicap ramp and all the way around is a giant tent and you'll see coffee and the ladies ministry had women's ministry had a, a whole women's ministry thing yesterday and there is leftovers guys so you won't want to miss that those goodies so praise the lord for that if you'll stand up we'll have our benediction father thank you for this service God, grant relief to many today from your word. And God will give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming today. Thank you so much for watching today's church service online. I hope it was a huge encouragement to you. I hope you learned something. And I hope you were filled with a little hope today and joy for the future. Uh, that's what South Bay Bible Church is all about. Our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and that's so important because that's the mission that God gave to the church. And that's what makes the church the greatest mission and work on earth because we are the conduit that God uses to uh, spread the gospel message throughout the world. So I'd like to take a moment and ask you to partner with us at South Bay Bible Church in a couple of ways. First of all, pray for us. 
Uh, we want to do everything in God's will that he wants us to do. Pray that he, he would give us boldness and confidence to just take this message and more people would log on and more people would hear this life-changing message. And secondly, we pray that you would partner with us in this ministry uh, financially, that you would click on the link above uh, that says online giving or go to South Bay Church LI dot org slash giving and uh, give and, and, and consider contributing to South Bay Bible Church so we can take the same message you just heard that was encouraging and uplifting and that so many more people can hear it as we look at new avenues to do that. In addition, we would like to know if you have any prayer requests. Uh, we have a prayer team that prays every single day at South Bay Bible Church. And if you have a prayer request, just click the prayer link above or go to southbaychurchli.org slash prayer and uh, give us those prayer requests. We'd love to support you in that way. In addition, we just want to ask you to come back next week and hear another message from the Lord. Uh, and, and I pray that God would bless you mightily this week and encourage you and keep you in good health. We'll see you again next Sunday.